Friends, uh, please join me in prayer. Our precious Father in heaven, please speak to us. Please remind us of your goodness and kindness in Christ. And please call us uh, to the incredible opportunity of growing like him. We pray that you'll do it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, the famous uh, Welsh preacher and evangelist Martin Lloyd-Jones once described God's kingdom in these words, and I just love this. May I say it with reverence, there is nothing I know of that is so romantic as God's method of accountancy. Be prepared for surprises in this kingdom. You never know what is going to happen. The last shall be first. What a complete reversal of our materialistic outlook. The last first. The first, last, everything upside down. The whole world is turned upside down by grace. It is not of man, it is of God. It is the kingdom of God. How excellent this is. I wonder how long it is since you've kind of felt some of the wide-eyed wonder of the excellence and goodness of the way that the gospel turns the whole world on its head. How long it's been since you've thought of the richness of God's upside-downness and of the privilege of becoming like Jesus. Uh, Friends, uh, you're in first year for some of you and you don't realise this, but we're in the middle of a very long-running series that I've been preaching in 2 Corinthians uh, that's lasted since 2017. Um, We're up to 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 over the next couple of weeks and as we go there, we're going to look at how God's preaching about Jesus and the nature of God's kingdom turns our whole world upside down when it comes to thinking about generosity. Uh, And my prayer under God is that as we come to think about how we deal with our money and our possessions in our life, what we will really see uh, is the nature of the character of our God who is generous beyond all measure. And we would catch just a brief hint of the glory and privilege of becoming like Jesus, his son. Now, When you get to 2 Corinthians 8, and having started with this kind of big introduction about generosity, I want to point out that in some ways, 2 Corinthians 8 is not so much about generosity as it is about keeping your word. It appears that about 12 months before the letter was written, Paul had had written or engaged with the Corinthians to tell them about the famine going on amongst the saints in Jerusalem. And at the time, the Corinthians had responded boldly. They'd kind of rolled out the platforms. They'd gathered up the trumpets. They'd declared as loudly as they could from the pulpits, yes, we're going to help. We're going to support these people who are struggling in Jerusalem. And yet the time has gone on, and it appears just possible that the Corinthians' execution might not have matched their zeal in the original promise. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 10. In this matter, I give my judgment... This benefits you who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also to desire to do it. So now finish doing it as well, so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your completing it. The Corinthians said, we want to use our possessions to help those who are struggling in Jerusalem, but it appears that the promise may not have been matched by the reality. And in a sense, this section is written to exhort and encourage the Corinthians to keep their word. And as Paul does it, um, he seems to resort at some level, to pastoral tactics that you and I might think are slightly questionable. Come back with me to verse 7. He says to the Corinthians, mind you, as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in your love, in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. Um, we know from both the Corinthians letters that the Corinthians are kind of, they're quite proud and excited about kind of their spirituality and their goodness and their living out of the Christian life. And it's almost like Paul's tapping into this kind of vein that's almost not quite godly, but he's still willing to kind of use their apparent zeal and call them to the reality of that zeal. And so he says, just as you seem to want to be zealous in so many Christian things, well, make sure that this opportunity of grace of giving becomes one of those things that you excel in because it's kind of part and parcel central to the Christian life. Now as Paul seeks to exhort them towards this generosity, this fulfilling of what they've promised, um, he feels I think in a little bit of a bind because it's something that he kind of wants to say you should keep your word but it's also something that he wants to flow out of the conviction of their hearts rather than in response to external pressure. 
And so he's treading this line between saying, you really ought to do this, and I want you to do this because you want to do it. And so in verse 8, he says, I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. Paul doesn't kind of want to come out, out and out and command them to bring to fulfilment what they've promised that they will do. Um, he's nervous about the nature of command, not that commands are bad or wrong, but in a sense, commands come externally and provide an external pressure that doesn't always lead our hearts to long to do what we know is right to do. And so he wants to exhort them and remind them of the importance of fulfilling their word, but he doesn't want to command them. And in part, I think the reason that he does all of this is because at his heart, what he longs for them is what is best for them. So see how he describes it again in verse 10. In this matter, I give my judgment, this benefits you. I want you to be people who have been so captured and delighted by the truth of who you are in Christ that you will eagerly bring to fulfilment what you have promised. You will delight in giving what you have said that you will give. And for Paul... The reason that this benefits them is because of what lies at the very heart of the gospel. Verse 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you by his poverty might become rich. You know, as a part of this passage, I thought it's a bit of a strange thing about wealth, right? The more you have of it, the harder it is to give all of it away. See, imagine you had a dollar left in the world. You had the clothes on your back and you had a dollar left and someone walks past you on the sidewalk and says, give me the dollar. Well, in a sense, you can give away the dollar because it's neither here nor there. The dollar's not even kind of a meal. You either give it away or you keep it, but it's not, it doesn't feel like it's sustaining you, right? What if you had your last $10 in the world? How, how easy would it be to give away all 10 of the dollars? Okay, now imagine $100 or $1,000. Now imagine that you had all of the money that you have sitting in your bank account, whatever that number is, and you had the opportunity to give all of that away. Isn't it strange that that starts to feel a bit more uncomfortable? Now imagine that you owned the universe. Every last square inch of it. And that all of the planets existed because they had come from the breath of your mouth and the work of your hands. Every element, every piece of gold, every precious metal, all of the people, all of the everything. Imagine that you had lived in perfect relationship with your heavenly father in the heavenly realms and the opportunity came to give it all away. To be made into a human being to go through the ignominy of birth, all of the blood and the mess and the muck of human birth, in a barn, no less, where they didn't even have a cradle for you to lay your head. And imagine you gave all that up to be born into human existence so that you could walk on our earth with almost no possessions apart from the clothing on your back and that you would walk around the earth and teach the truth of God in order to be ridiculed and scorned, and spat upon, and laughed at, and eventually to be tried falsely for things that you didn't do, to have people crush thorns onto your brow and worship you in false humility, to make you carry the beam of your cross through the streets of Jerusalem, and to nail you a limb at a time to that cross for the sins of the world. Though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. And what did Jesus do for you as he died for you and was raised again to life? He brought you forgiveness for every wrong that you have ever done. And he brought you the privilege of being able to cry out to the God who made the universe and say, Abba, Father, and be called his sons and daughters. And you were granted to drink of the Holy Spirit by whom you are in communion and being transformed and who is the down payment and hope 
of an eternal restoration when the whole of the creation has been restored and you'll actually sit as rulers and judges in the new heavens and the new earth. When Paul cries out to the Corinthians, do what you promised, he's actually inviting them into the privilege of becoming like Christ. Because what did Christ do? He gave up everything for the good of the other. And so he says to the Corinthians, if you knew Jesus, if you knew just just a hint of a taste of the goodness of Jesus, you would realise that hanging on to your possessions is the stupidest thing that you could do in the world. Would you rather hang on to your wealth or become like Christ? Would you rather hold tight to your money or be transformed into the likeness of God? But friends, the thing that I love about the Apostle Paul is that he goes from the sublime to the earthy in a matter of moments. And see, in the depth of the riches of the gospel, and then he turns around to deal with a couple of the problems that might be plaguing the Corinthians' hearts. Verse 11. So now finish it as well, so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. Now, we're not sure whether maybe the Corinthians kind of overpromised and life has kind of left them not being able to quite do what they wanted to do, and so they're embarrassed. Or maybe he's just saying, even if you feel like you're struggling a bit, there is still good stuff there to be given away. But his reminder is that generosity is not about the amount, but it is actually genuinely about your heart. Um, and so he says, it, it, in a sense, it doesn't matter what you have to give. Become like Christ in learning to be generous with what has given you. And in a way, Paul starts to speak to the reality of all of our human hearts, that when it comes to giving the thing away, it starts to nag at us. Um, as a kid growing up, I actually I didn't grow up in a poor household at all, but I grew up in a frugal household, uh, for which I am now thankful for my parents. Um, but one of the things about growing up in that household was that all of my friends at school got to spend money at the canteen multiple days of the week. I got money for the canteen about once a term. Now, when I got money for the canteen and I went along and that, you know, the amazing range of goodies that lies there before you and you've got that little dollar in your hot little hand, well, actually 50 cents, but anyway, um, it was another age. Um, and, you, you know, and I'd bought that packet of chips and my friends would say, can I have one? <laughs> this thing kind of right... <laughs> no, you can't have one! <laughs> These are my chips. I've waited a whole term for these chips. Uh, But it kind of describes something about us that kind of lingers at times, doesn't it? The sense that if I give it away, somehow I will be losing. Whereas what Paul is saying, it's not about how much or how much you give away, but the joy of giving it away and becoming like Christ means more than anything. And Paul moves on to clear up another disagreement or possible problem in verse 13. I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. As it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over and whoever gathered little had no lack. It seems that perhaps for the Corinthians, or perhaps again, Paul's just dealing with the reality of the human heart, When it comes to generosity, we can start to calculate. (laughs) Will my giving up what I've got actually mean that they get more than I've got and it will be an imbalance that's going to be unhelpful or unfair? That's an interesting space, isn't it? Because the Bible doesn't say, lack discernment in your generosity. I mean, Paul's instructions about caring for the widows in 1 Timothy 5 tells the church, be thoughtful about who you give your money away to. And yet at the same time, Paul wants to exhort and encourage these people Don't sit down and do all of the maths. There are people that you know who are in need. And they might be weirdly in need. Do you know how we're brokenly in need? Sometimes people have a lot of one thing and not much of another. He says, be generous to them in their moment of need and know that in God's riches, he will supply your needs even out of their generosity when the time and the circumstances need it. God is the God of provision and as you give it away, you will not lack. But brothers and sisters, what lies behind the entire passage, I think, is Paul's longing for the Corinthians' hearts to grasp what they have missed, which is the opportunity to be generous is an enormous privilege. 
And that's actually why he starts with the Macedonians. And I just want you to reflect, just as I read aloud this section on the Macedonians, about what they actually did. What does this passage tell you they actually did? Verse 1, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favour of taking part in the relief of the saints, and this not as we expected. But they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. Don't you want to be like the Thessalonians? They actually, out of delight and relationship with the Lord, decided that they wanted to give to the saints. And because they saw the need of another, and although they were poor, and perhaps Paul was saying, no, you guys don't need to give, they begged for the opportunity to be generous. What would you beg for? What would you get on your knees and plead for the opportunity to do? They got on their knees and pleaded for the opportunity to be generous with what they had for the good of these brothers and sisters in the Lord. What to do with all of this? Two quick reflections as we finish. The first is, the Corinthians promised big but struggled with execution. And I just want you to reflect on that for a moment in terms of the own, your own way in terms of treating people. Um, one of the dangers for us in ministry is the danger of longing to be popular uh, and being open and welcoming with our home and possessions and other things. Sometimes, in my experience, that leads some to be very warm and kind of almost over-promising in their initial interactions with people which then fail to get fulfilled in their ongoing relationships with people. I just wonder what it is that you promise in in small or even unspoken ways in your interactions with people uh, and whether you're doing it in order to kind of draw them in but it's something that you'd fail to fulfil. Or are there ways in which you've promised to do good in the past but haven't done good that maybe you need to fulfil? Then I encourage you, for your sake in Jesus, vow that you're going to go away and do something about that. But the second thing to say is, just reflect on perhaps your neighbours, the people around about you at college or the people in your church. Is there someone or somewhere or something that it might be good for you as an opportunity to exercise generosity sometime in the next week? Is there some space, somewhere that you can think of that a small act of kindness or a giving up of some of your money or a small gift or even perhaps a bigger gift might be for the good of others and for the good of your own heart? Brothers and sisters, what a privilege to become like the one who though he was rich yet for your sakes he became poor so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Let's pray. Father God, we pray for our stingy hearts and ask, please, that by your grace you would forgive them and remind us again today of your kindness in Christ. Father, please remind us to be overwhelmed by the nature of his generosity and help us to be excited by the privilege of those who get to be generous. And so, Father, with our lot or with our little, please change our hearts and please help us to bring that to fruition this week. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.